composition of Rajya Sabha, that is the upper house, changes again with many new MPs swearing in and a number of MPs retiring. There is an old saying that the people who retire from the Rajya Sabha are members who are very wise and they carry pearls of wisdom along with them. On the show this week, one of such Rajya Sabha MPs who've just retired, Anu Aga, on the show. I welcome you. Thanks. Would you agree when I say that you're carrying pearls of wisdom along with you as you retire from the upper house? I'm not so sure if I carried any wisdom to the house when I joined okay. and whether I'm carrying any wisdom out of it. I can say that I'm carrying disappointment, frustration, a lot of resilience to go through the six years. So these are my prominent feelings. So basically your, your, your journey, you're saying, has not been a very happy one. Uh, I never watched TV, so I didn't know what I was in for. But ever since I've joined, there have been so many disruptions. And I wasn't prepared for that. It's frustrating to come all the way from Pune, leave whatever little good work I was doing there, to be here and come home every half an hour or for the day. Yeah. So to me, I feel people may disagree, but they need to learn the art of discussion and carrying on. I met a member of parliament from the British parliament, and he said not once has the house adjourned, not once. I don't know if this is the difference between a matured democracy and an evolving democracy, but what worries me is that most members are not concerned and they justify saying disruption is part of the democratic process. And that to me is really wasting the country's time and resources and the hope with which the people sent us to Rajya Sabha. I, that's what I feel. What do you think is a reason why, because when disruptions happen, when stalemates are there inside the house, uh, whom would you really blame? Are the parliamentarians to be blamed? The government of the day, the opposition? There are so many elements. You know, I don't know. I'm not a politician. I'm a nominated member. So I don't know what's going behind the scene. But I know that because we have the TV, which most countries have, the members want to show to the constituency that we are fighting so much for you. See, we are disrupting the house, we are doing our best. That's what I was told. That's one of the reasons why people go to the well and shout to show to their constituency how much they are trying for the cause. Do you think that's a disturbing trend and how can it be rectified? I think unless everyone sits together and the system changes, I, it's getting worse. I'm told that over the years, the disruption and the behavior in Parliament is getting worse. So I don't know the solution, but I don't think any one or two person can bring about change. I think there has to be a lot of discussion, anguish, and a will to bring about a change. Uh, I believe, and I'm not sure, that you are allowed to throw out the member who disrupts, but no chair throws them out because I'm told every party at one time or another disrupts and they don't want to be thrown out. So they all get together to say, let's not throw people out. It's funny, they have so many differences, the different parties, but when it's something of interest to all, they all unite. For example, when I was in the standing parliamentary standing committee for personal public grievance law and justice we brought in the idea of bringing all parties under right to information and we had so many people from the outside world saying they should come but all the parties united and said no we will not come we do not take anything from the public uh, what do you say, public resources, so we are not supposed to be under RTI. And that's a pity, 
because real accountability would have come if that had happened. How do you strengthen the institution of parliament? Like as you said, that day by day things are worsening. There is a general decadence, there is a general degeneration in the parliamentary values. And when I say parliamentary values, the question is that do the parliamentarians believe in, in a thing like parliamentarian, parliamentary values? Uh, if I were to ask you your experience in the last six years and your interactions you've had with, with your colleagues, uh, there would have been moments where you would have deliberated on these issues as well with them. What, what, is your, what does your experience say? I think the problem is the kind of people we choose to come to the parliament. Okay. And uh, I think that again is about the nation. And ADR, the organization, brings out uh, on each member their history and record, whether they have any criminal record, they have broken the law, what is it? And yet such people are brought into power. I'm told by another book I read that the poor are not interested whether you are a criminal or a whatever you are, but are you willing to help me when I need you? So when there is illness, indebtedness, marriage, and even not a decent person is willing to lend them money or give them money, they will vote him in. So in a way, it's tied up with our dire poverty and the way our people live. So it's such a deep-rooted thing. I wouldn't know where the problem starts, but till our people are economically better, are educated, and not just educated in the sense of uh, just being literate. Having said that, America is pretty literate and see who they have chosen. So literacy doesn't bring wisdom in the voters. But uh, then the question is that if, if the parties, like you said, that there are many parliamentarians with criminal antecedents and then also they make their way into the House, uh, then again the question is how do you really rectify the system? And until unless there is a certain will, there is a certain volition on the part of the individual parties, how and will the, the system nation, change? And the nation demands, as such. Nation demands. You know, you keep getting on social media, lots of things. Do we parliamentarians have a right to get this kind of salary, these kind of perks, this kind of pension for what we do? And that's a very legitimate question. But it has to translate into some action, not just in the social media. People have to really demand that enough is enough. And they select people who matter. Otherwise, even so-called Ahmadmi, which started on the anti-corruption, has become in like any other like party any because other the system party. is rotten. You cannot elect a person with the amount that is given. So it starts with corruption. When you look back at your journey in the last six years, uh, obviously the nominated members, they come from respective fields and they are supposed to give their maximum to the house in terms of their experience and in terms of from whichever field they come. You were an industrialist turned social worker. You've contributed a lot to the fields of education, social responsibilities. Uh, I'm sure you would say that you have many unfinished agendas left. I don't think anybody was interested in anything that I could offer. I made my maiden speech after two and a half years. Okay. Partly my fault because I was told that when something related to education is being discussed, I can talk on education. But I didn't realize every budget means every topic is covered and I could have spoken. So anyway, I spoke after two and a half years hardly anybody was in the house. Even when I gave my farewell speech, I mean, not just mine, others also, there was hardly anybody in there. So who's listening to what you're saying? So if that's, that's a very significant point you're making, that when you speak, there is hardly anybody to listen. So how do the things reach the people? If a parliamentarian is not heard, when a parliamentarian is making a speech, making a point on a certain issue which is important for the nation, and if the parliamentarian is not heard, then how, how, how do the voices reach the people then? Through the TV, I suppose. Through the TV, it reaches the people. 
But is the government in power listening? I'm not so sure. And are, even if they listen, are they doing, are they consulting us? If we are supposed to bring certain expertise, was I ever consulted on anything? Never. You had experiences of two governments, like you, uh, you joined in 2012 and now it's 2018. You had the experience of your interactions with the UPA, you've had interaction, you've experiences of interacting with the present government. Uh, if I were to ask you to scale it on, on maybe out of 10, how would you rate the two governments? In Without getting into the politics yes, of it. Yes, in parliament, all was the same. There was disruption during the time uh, Congress was in power. There is disruption when UPA, I'm mean, sorry, the NDA government is in power. So there wasn't much to choose at all. So you mean to say that the ruling government, no matter if it, even if it changes, yes. It, it doesn't make a difference. Make doesn't, you know, I seem a bit pessimist, negative, and I'm such a positive person normally, but six years in parliament has made me pretty negative. I see, I worry about the future of our country. I really do. I feel, are we really concerned about the issues? If anything, the ruling party brings, the opposition opposes. GST was brought in by Congress when uh, the BJP opposed. When BJP brought up, the Congress opposed. So it's not what's good for my country, but what's good to make me go further in politics. So I feel that's not a real, just because you're in opposition, you don't oppose for the sake of opposition. Having said that, I've had some good experiences also. Uh, when the Lokpal bill was passed, uh, all the members of the NGO are supposed to declare their assets in the public domain, and if they don't, it's a criminal offense. And I went and met heads of many parties, and they all said, this is something they didn't realize, and we all passed it, we are all responsible. So in Rajya Sabha, I got together all the parties, and under the leadership of Sharad Pawar, we went to see Mr. Narendra Modi, our Prime Minister. He was very gracious. He listened to us and said, I can't change the law, but I won't activate it. And he's kept his word. So this was a good thing I could do because the NGO world would have suffered tremendously. Right. When I first joined, right in the beginning, some people came to me that the laws for morphine are so strict. First of all, morphine comes under finance law because years ago we used to export it to China. Right. That was years ago, but it still comes under finance. And the Inspector Raj is so bad and so corrupt that the smaller hospitals don't want to bother about keeping it and the HIV, the cancer patients and other patients really suffer, really suffer. So the law was coming for review and I requested the Congress and I believe they made a little change, but not substantive. It's still very difficult to get morphine. Parliament being the highest legislative body and they are the ones who would be making the laws. But when ultimately this, these laws are not implemented properly or the laws are not made properly because of whatever reasons, because of disruptions. So you, what kind of a future do you really see of, of the Indian parliamentary system? Well, implementation is not in the hands of the parliament. Right. And that's very, very poor in India. But there are so many issues that need deliberation. I mean, I just gave you one example of morphine where people suffer, education, health, basic things like that, job creation, skill development. I mean, I don't know how our poor uh, stay quiet and put up with so much. I wouldn't be able to if I were poor. We really don't care about them. We give them lip sympathy. For example, on Women's Day, we were, all women were asked to speak. Right. And many members suggested that we bring in 33% reservation for women. That is maybe needed. But my concern was why have Women's Day for one day in a year? 
every day should, we don't have men's year, uh, day, do we? Because they have their way throughout. And this is a little tokenism thrown our way when we see that female feticide is on the rise. The security of women is not there on the roads. Rape is on the rise. So I think these are the issues we should be debating and doing something about, not just uh, celebrating one token Women's Day. So I must when, say, when you were made to stand as a woman MP on the Women's Day to make your speech, uh, do you find it demeaning or do you found it derogatory as a woman making a speech like that on a Women's Day? No, I must say, I didn't find it derogatory or anything like that, but the whole concept of a Women's Day, Just for is, a day is to me not acceptable. It's very good for the people who make the cards, Hallmark and all that, but I don't buy that nonsense. Mother's Day, Father's Day. You have to respect and be good to your parents throughout the year, not one day in a year. Uh, you, you raked up a very important issue when uh, you spoke about uh, this 33% uh, women's reservation. Rajya Sabha still has just about 11% representation of women. Now, not talking particularly about the House, but when you talk about the individual political parties, they themselves are not very willing towards giving tickets to women. Now, how does the mindset change so that we find when more you and more... someone who's not a politician, so I wouldn't know how to change that mindset. And I personally have ambiguity towards reservation. A part of me says that unless you do that, things won't change. Another thing tells me that women don't need this little crumb thrown at them. They're capable only if all the parties realize that they are missing out by not taking women in as representatives for the candidates. So I think the parties, it's still a very patriarchal system. Uh, I see that I live in this parliament building, the way men ask me questions. It's a very patriarchal way of doing things. If I come home late, one parliamentarian asked me, Kaan gai thi? My husband has never, had never asked me that question. Maybe he didn't mean it, but to me, it was very demeaning. To me, the way we keep our premises, it's so dirty. We call Swatch Bharat. I wish the Prime Minister would take a look around all the MP quarters and see who at the back, how dirty it's kept. We don't segregate our uh, trash. We don't. In Pune, it would be unheard of that you don't not segregate it. Uh, so if we don't set a good example what are we expecting from our citizens? And educated people with power. What you hint at is, is, is a very serious uh, indication of the fact that uh, maybe the parliamentarians are not sensitive towards uh, subjects like what you just pointed out, maybe health, education. Uh, there is a general insensitivity. Or towards the rights of women to go out and do what they want, when they want, without being accountable. So you mean to say that they're all doing lip service when they say no, that? No, I don't know. Just this question, kaha gai thi, is to me very demeaning. Why I, where I go at 10.30 at night is my business, not anybody else's. You were nominated with 11 of your other colleagues and, uh, in 2012. So when I talk about the nominated members, they of course come from the respective fields with different experiences. and. Uh, but there were a whole lot of, without getting into the names of which MP I'm talking about, and people would understand, but there have been question marks on members who've not taken part in discussions, they've not raised questions, they've not uh, come up with any private member bill. Uh, what do you have to say to such nominated members? I mean, what is your opinion about uh, these kind of nominated members? It's a weight of waste of a seat. And I think when you nominate a member, I wasn't made, it, this was not made explicit, but I took it, took my responsibility seriously. But I wish when people are nominated, they are told very clearly that you have to attend, regularly participate. Would you be willing to do that? Only then should we nominate those people. I can understand for a certain period they have to do certain things, they don't come. That any member can. 
but for that there's a procedure you have to write to the chair take his leave but just not turn up at all or turn up for half an hour in each session or not even for each session is really sad to me do you think that the government should maybe discourage uh, this kind of a trend of nominating people at all uh, or maybe just cancelling their membership if at all they don't turn up at all in the house i wouldn't like to make comments on that but i think if you make it very explicit what are your responsibilities when you are nominated and you accept it that hasn't been done because i know one nominated member was told that if you come for half an hour every term that's good enough now if that's the message given and i don't know if that person is not understood correctly i have no idea but you have to make it very clear the expectations should be high and i think that category can bring certain expertise if you listen to them and you draw them in without that what's the use but if a particular nominated person like a or b comes with a certain glamour quotient comes with a big celebrity value and maybe the parliamentarians or the the government is is unable to put its word words uh, properly to them that look this is how you should conduct yourself this is how you should be regular with your attendance but somehow you know those messages are not conveyed properly to them so what does one imbibe like it's like a very taken for granted kind of an attitude to me this glamour for celebrity in india is something i've never understood we are all human beings today i have wealth today someone might have some whatever skill which makes that person a film star or a sports person but they are all human beings and if you are in parliament there are certain requirements what is there to be odd and not be able to state what their responsibilities are i have never understood this running after celebrities having photos taken all that nonsense to me that i cannot understand attendance of parliamentarians also has been another uh, uh, very disturbing trend which has been seen inside parliament irrespective of which governments have been in power but for the last uh, almost like 15 years or 10 years the trend has really been bad that there is a general perception that parliamentarians are not interested in attending the house uh, what do you feel again if you ask me for politicians i have nothing to comment it's for the parties to take action uh, i see the house empty very often but why is there some work in their constituency that takes them away i have no idea so i wouldn't like to comment on that but i think if each party made each person accountable not only just for their attendance but for their contribution uh, for example prs runs such two wonderful programs one on wednesday they call an expert on different subjects and the next day they very objectively they are not saying they are for or against at all objectively discuss the bill that's going to be discussed maximum 16 18 people come maximum that's on the high side five people seven people turn up so if you are not going to educate yourself make yourself or maybe they all know it and i don't know so i i don't know maybe i'm ignorant so i need to go so you have attended these sessions regularly i did i did attend regularly so this is one positive memory which you carry back i carry you. very positive memory of prs doing super job by really educating us and making us aware and they are willing to spend time with you come to your house and explain they will go to any length to help you but you have to seek the help yeah. you for uh, your contribution in the field of education has has been really uh, extensive now when you hear uh, things like paper leak and uh, uh, the quality of education uh, in fact you work towards equity bringing about equity in education and uh, so what is your general perception about the way the present education standards uh, are being carried forward why do you say present ever since we became independent have we done anything substantive for education to me right to education has emphasized infrastructure 
and brought in more corruption because given the inspectors more right to close down private schools but no accountability for government schools all the rules that apply to private schools like a compound a compound wall which to me are okay but what makes teaching really is a good teacher and our teacher training institutes are rotten i must say the present government is attempting to change that in some ways it is i've seen in maharashtra i've seen uh, the secretary here in delhi doing trying very hard but the system is rotten it's the old legacy of british days what did the british want people who are obedient and not really educating and educated and questioning and that we are carrying on in the worst form teachers have to pay to get into the system when you talk about uh, the system within the education sector uh, uh, about health everything yeah but, but talking specifically about education and since you are uh, the chairman for teach for india as well so uh, when the present government talks about you know changing things like learning outcomes they're talking seriously about the training of the teachers at all levels at rural and urban levels so don't you think that somewhere a beginning has been made but that's of course it's an evolutionary process so that's going to take time i would give credit to this government to emphasize on outcomes to try and change the system and they have started it but it's too slow and too little too slow for example in bihar people objected to stopping te- cheating they think it's their right to cheat if you come to that level what kind of values do we hold then corruption is part of that system isn't it so this government has tried a little at least i know in maharashtra and in the center at the center but too little and too slow as you said in the beginning that uh, the memories which you carry of the last 6 years they haven't been very encouraging for you and uh, like what you said in the beginning yeah and i have learned i mean if i had not been in parliament i would not have known what the reality is because i never watch tv i'm really not a person who ever watches so i came to know the underbelly of india and uh, i'm being very frank with the hope that some change happens change doesn't happen by denying things and pretending all is well all is not well and we need something radically to change the quality of members we send to parliament accountability from them so if given a chance would you contest elections since you've not seen the very brighter side of the last 6 years if given a chance would you contest elections and come back into the political system again no thank you okay on that note it's a pleasure talking to you anu thank you So that's it on this episode of To the Point. See you next time with another personality. Goodbye and thanks for watching.